Today is March 27, 2013, and we are interviewing Howard Bateman at O'Fallon Public Library. Mr. Bateman was born 12 10 uh, 20 or no 1935. Um, Mr. Bateman, I am Cheryl Walker and I'll be interviewing you and Deborah Musak will be the court reporter. Could you state for the record what war and branch of service you served in? Uh, Vietnam, U.S. Air Force. And what was your rank when you... Master Sergeant. Okay. When I was, well, that's what I retired at. I was Staff Sergeant over there. Okay. Did you retire from the service? Yes, ma'am. So how many years were you in? 21 years, one month, and 23 days. What were you, was your service dates? I joined... 9 September 57 and retired 1 November 1978. Okay, and where did you start your basic training at? Lackland Air Force Base, Texas. Were you drafted? No. No. The Air Force is always volunteer. Air Force is always volunteer. Yes, ma'am. Even back then, it was volunteer. I did not know that. What made you decide to enlist into the Air Force? So the Army wouldn't draft me. Plus, in about 1942, in the Second World War, where my parents and I lived at the time, I saw about a full squadron of B-24s come over at low altitude, and I decided then if I ever went to service, it'd be the Air Force. When I was about six, seven years old. Okay. What did you do in the Air Force? I started out with ground refueling, which is what I was doing in Southeast Asia. I was the first sergeant for about a year, and then I got into the Air Force Ground Safety Program, which is what I retired out of. After Lackland Air Force Base, where did you take your advanced training at? There was no such, well, yeah, there was. I uh, went to fuel school at Amarillo Air Force Base, Texas. And how long were you there? <laughs> Not truthfully, I don't remember. About uh, three or four months, as I remember, probably. When you talk about refueling um, training, what actually did you do? Put the fuel on the aircraft, received, stored, and issued all fuels on the base, um, have gas, aviation gasoline, JP, jet fuel, motor gasoline, all the oils, uh, accounted for it, did the lab work on it, uh, manufactured liquid oxygen for the planes that required oxygen to go up to altitude. When you say you manufactured liquid out um, oxygen. oxygen, how, what kind of... They, had a big, they all I can remember is they had a big compressor that took oxygen out of there and compressed it down into liquid and we stored it and uh, they had special tanks we put it into and they took it out and put it on the aircraft and the tanks on the aircraft. Were there special aircraft that carried all this? No, man, about anything the Air Force had at the time did, especially the bombers. Um, <clears throat> what other things did you have to do while you were at um, Texas, in Texas? That's about it. Just KP on occasion and go to school. What were your KP duties? Do you remember? Normally, we took the uh, area where they cleaned the mess trays, and we'd figured out that if you pulled them before they rinsed the soap off, we could give the permanent party and the teachers a case of the GIs, and we got out of school for a day or so. Okay. Um, so, 
did you know that you were going to be going overseas? Didn't go straight overseas. I went from uh, Amarillo to Lincoln, Nebraska, to Strategic Air Command, and then in 1960, the Air Force transferred me up to Thule, Greenland, which is 1,200 miles above the Arctic Circle for a year. Okay, what did you do in Greenland? Refueled aircraft. Okay. Was that, um, can you tell us a little bit about Greenland? It's cold. Uh, I stepped off the plane on the 26th of June, 1960, on my wife's birthday, and there was 26 feet of snow on the ground. And six inches of dust on the roads, and amazingly, it very seldom snowed, actually snowed on the base. The snow blew down off the ice cap. So you really didn't have snow. You had dust, but there was snow that blew off the ice cap. Ice cap, yeah. And you were married at this time. Yes, ma'am. I was married before I went in the Air Force. I was married three months before I went in the Air Force. And your wife was not stationed with you? Was not allowed up in Greenland? No, ma'am. That was a remote tour. Okay. When you say remote, what do you mean? Well, you couldn't take family. Okay. And how long were you stationed there? One year. Pretty lonely. Mm. And cold? Quite. And how, what kind of um, uniforms did they issue you? We had normal fatigues and they issued us Navy cold weather gear because we were out, we had to work outside quite a bit. And it was better than what the Air Force had. We had that and we had Air Force parkings. Things. So, um, keeping the equipment to be able to run in that kind of weather, was that difficult? Did you have special techniques that you used? No, ma'am. No. How do you, how do you keep the, the fuel from freezing? Well, in refueling aircraft, you didn't really have tools. You had, uh, Hose cars that you connected to uh, a pipeline and then cutting back to the aircraft where you had the fuel on a truck that carried 5,000 gallons and you connected it to the aircraft and pump fuel. If you're doing it with a truck, then the trucks are all kept inside in heated, heated bays. You took one out, refueled the aircraft, and put it back in the heated bay. If an aircraft came in, recip engine, in other words, propellers. If it was on the ground over a certain length of time, it had to be in a heated hangar. What were your living conditions like up there? In barracks, we had uh, had what they call Arctic doors, walls, and windows. They were somewhere around two foot thick, heavily insulated to keep the cold out. Um, is it? Does, are the days longer up there or the evenings longer? Everybody talks about six months of sun and six months of dark. What you actually had and have, you know, with the global warming, it's probably changed. When I was up there, you had uh, about three months of total sunlight, 24 hours a day. Then you went into twilight with the nighttime lengthening out, then you had three months of total darkness, then you went into three months of twilight, going back toward three hour, three months of total daylight, 24 hours a day. Did you get leave while you were up there? I took an emergency leave because our second child was due, and she went, uh, supposed to be born in December, and she wasn't born until February. So I came home emergency leave, stayed, stayed home a little over a month. I bet that was difficult to leave your wife after having a new baby. Yeah, but you knew it, you know, it's what you contracted for. So after Greenland? Minot, North Dakota, which was not much different in Greenland. And if you talk to my wife, she'll tell you that the month of January of 1962 
the warmest it got the whole month was 20 below zero. It's the only place I was ever at where I froze a car radiator. I froze a radiator one day before I got out of town. And that's after having the car on a engine heater all night, and I still froze the radiator the next morning before I got out of town. And again, did you do the same duties there? Same duties, refueling. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And did you uh, live on base? No, ma'am. We lived downtown. I didn't have enough rank to live on base. So what was your rank? I was a airman second class when I got there. there I was an airman first class, three striper when I left. Okay. Um, in my not, uh, did you get transferred there with any of the men that you were in Greenland with? Your... Not in my particular branch. There was a young man there that served up in Greenland when I was there that worked in personnel. So then you were stationed there for how long? About two years. Mm -hmm. And from there I went to uh, Bunker Hill Air Force Base, Indiana, which I requested at when I re-enlisted the first time because it was close to home in Illinois where my wife and I were from. And that was your first re-enlistment? Re yes, ma'am. And... Like, 1961, I went to Indiana in, I think, 62, mm -hmm. right after the uh, Cuban Missile Crisis. Mm -hmm. Were you involved in Cuba? No. no. Okay. So, um, did you live on base at that point? No, uh, we lived in uh, Peru, Indiana, and then uh, right before I got orders to Southeast Asia, we bought a mobile home and parked it out right across from the base. Did you live in an area that many of the same people that uh, you w worked with also lived in? The uh, mobile home park was mainly Air Force people. Mm -hmm. uh, Peru, they, we were scattered all over town in Peru. So. How did the community accept the military at that point? Very well. Much better than they did when I came back from Southeast Asia. Not particularly there, but the country as a whole. So at this point, when you were in Indiana, you went to Southeast Asia. Yeah, went to Thailand, yes, ma'am. And you went with just your unit. You didn't get to take any family, or did you? Yeah, no family. I was not with a unit. I, uh, the Air Force seldom transfers a unit in mass. Uh, they move individuals. And uh, I went from Bunker Hill Air Force Base to uh, Uban Rajatani, Royal Thai Air Force Base in Thailand. Hmm. Why did they not move whole units? I have no idea. Mm -hmm. You know, the Army and the Marines and everything, uh, you went, they went as units, they can do a reunion with the unit they served with in Southeast Asia, for example. Uh, I'd hate to try to count how many different squadrons I was in in 21 years. So in Thailand, how long did you stay there? 11 months, three weeks, five days. Okay. And again, did you do the same duties? Yes, ma'am. I was in ground refueling there. We refueled F-4s, we had F-4s on the base, we had six squadrons of F-4Cs. We had some Air Force C-130s that flew specialized missions at night, and we had some C-121s, which were, I think their call sign was Crown, and they flew Airborne Command Post. And um, was this a big Air Force base over there in Thailand? It was a good size one, yes, ma'am. 
Where in Thailand? Was it in the center? Was it? It was up uh, in northeastern Thailand, not, you know, I think, maybe seven kilometers in from the Cambodian border or something like that, somewhere, something like that. Was, was it in a combat area? They told us we were getting shot at. The uh, planes all flew combat. The F-4Cs flew uh, North Vietnam and strikes on the Ho Chi Minh Trail. The uh, C-130s had specialized radar. And uh, the best way you can put it is they trolled the trail looking for truck convoys and such and then directed the F-4Cs in on at night. Um, what was um, your life there as as a military personnel? Well, my rank was such that uh, I couldn't live on base. I lived in a compound of bungalows in the town. Uh, made a lot of very good local national friends over there. We had local nationals that worked for us where I worked. You learned very quickly who you could trust and who you didn't as far as the businesses went. I had one jeweler I bought everything from. I had one tailor shop I went to, and I had a photography shop I went to. And uh, in my case, I cooked my meals where I lived at. I didn't need on base. Very seldom, maybe if I was working until midnight, I would go into the NCO club and catch midnight meal before I went off base rode what we called a bot bus off base, which is the local transportation. And was it just a bus? It's a bus. Mm -hmm. Open-sided bus run by the local people. Did you, um, what kind of food did you eat? You said you cooked for yourself. About like I would eat here. Uh, I would buy uh, meat, which wasn't the beef you see here, it was water buffalo. And uh, they had potatoes, they had about everything we had here. Did you um, go touring the country side over there? No. No, ma'am, it just was not safe. You know, as I said, they told us we weren't getting shot at, shot at so we couldn't get combat pay, but. Uh, I was going off base one night and someone came out of the bushes and put 21 bullet holes in the tree of the truck I was riding in. Did you get hurt? No, no, I didn't know that one, no. One went in front of me, one went behind me. and The kid that was driving the truck, taking me my quarters off base, said, you want to stop and check the truck? And I said, bleep the truck. Get out of here, you know. And my foot hit the gas, my foot hit the gas pedal on which it went. But they still allowed you to live off base. Yeah, there wasn't enough room on base. One quarter for everybody, so staff started and above as far as enlisted went. We lived off base. The higher ranking NCOs lived on base, and the officers, a lot, most of them lived on base, especially the flight crew. Um, and you were there for how long? Eleven months, three weeks, five days. Okay. Did you fly over there? I was not on flying status, but when I got there, the C-130s that flew missions at night, you could volunteer to go up with them and throw flares for the fighters to see to go in and hit the trucks. And that way you got combat pay. So I flew, I think, 10 missions that way. And how, how did you feel when you were flying those missions? Scared. Scared because they were shooting at us. Do you regret flying those missions? No, not really, no. Okay. Um, so, did you get go on leave when you were in Thailand? No, ma'am. The uh, Military in Vietnam 
could go R and R. I think once a year, once in a year there, maybe twice. I don't really remember. They could go to Australia, Hawaii, or Taiwan. In Thailand, I was there nine months for the admitted they had an American in the country. So we could not leave the country. We could take what they call an R and R, but we couldn't leave the country. So why bother? You know. So then, so nine months of your stay in Thailand, they didn't even admit that you were there. That was my understanding. Yeah. They didn't even acknowledge that there was a military base there. No, after about nine months, they said, "Oh yeah, we got six six air bases there." There were six. Yeah. So how many troops were there? Oh God, I have no idea on that one, man. Yeah. They had. Uh, Two bases that flew at 105s, we flew at 4Cs. At Udorn, they flew uh, RF 4Cs. I'm not sure what else. And uh, Sada Heap, they flew B 52s and KC 135s out of there. And then there was a, what they called Don Mog, which is the International Airport in Bangkok that everybody went in, at, in and out of. And then there was a few. Small army bases scattered around too. So. From Taiwan or Thailand, where did you go? Back to Bunkerville, Indiana. And how long were you there? Two years. And I went from there to Puerto Rico. Where in Puerto Rico? Ramey Air Force Base. And your duties were the same at this point? At that point, yes. And what rank were you there? As a staff sergeant, when I went down, a tech sergeant when I left, down the sergeant. Okay. And um, was your family with you at this point? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. And did you live on base at that time? Not when we first got there, but then we moved on base. Mm -hmm. When we first got there, we had a brand new home. We rented out in the middle of a sugarcane field. How was how was uh, your living um, down in Puerto Rico? Did you enjoy it? Um, yeah, I, I think we all enjoyed it. We were there four years, which is just a little long. You know, the island is, I think, 30 miles wide and 100 miles long, and you tend to run out of places to go and things to do. Yeah. And what, um, what all did you do in Puerto Rico? On duty, it was the same thing. I worked ground, in ground refueling. Uh, off duty at that point, I'd started working with the Boy Scouts in Indiana and I continued working with the Boy Scouts in Puerto Rico. Did you ever fly any missions? No. Okay. So after Puerto Rico, then what did you do? Travis Air Force Base, California. So you've been everywhere. Pretty much. And then about two years there, that's where I cross-trained out of the uh, fuel field and into ground safety. And from Travis then I went to, we went to uh, Lake and Heath, England. Everybody's Lake and Heath, everybody's England. That's where I made E7. And about a year after I got there, because I made E7, they moved me and the family down to Bentwaters Air Force Base. And where's that at? Hmm? And where's that at? England. England still. England. Where I became safety superintendent for the base. And uh, that's where I, I came back from and retired in 78. Okay. Um, ground safety. What actually does that entail? Uh, any type of accident prevention except uh, aircraft in the air and investigating all accidents, all mishaps, reporting them, corrective action. And did you do that just on your air bases? Yes, ma'am. So you didn't travel to other accident sites? If something happened on base, yeah, we had to go out and look at it anyway. You know. And did you ever have to do that? Not over there, no. Okay. 
Okay. So, um, did what kind of a um, of medals and citations did you receive? The standard ones. Uh, Army and Air Force Good Conduct Medal, Air Force Longevity Ribbons, uh, Marksmanship, uh, Presidential Unit Citation, I think four times, Air Force Outstanding Unit Award three or four times. Uh, like the truth, I can't remember all of them. Okay. And um, did you share in any type of battle planning? No. no. Was it difficult in that time period when you were traveling so much and the time that you were away from your family to stay in touch with them? It was the only way you do it was by, by mail. When I was in Thailand, I had a friend that worked in Com Squadron and he could get me military line so far. I know the first time I called home from Southeast Asia and my wife wasn't home and I talked to my oldest son and he told him, told him Janet when she came home from grocery shopping, his dad called and she didn't believe him. <laughs> the amazing thing was I could journey back to uh, Hawaii and as I remember it didn't matter. I had to call collecting there and the charges were always the same. Basically the same. I don't remember what they were. So when when did you get to go to Hawaii? When did I what? Get to go to Hawaii. I didn't. You didn't? Not in the military. No, I stayed in Thailand. Okay. Okay. Um, <clears throat> did you, you know, you said that the time or when you were in Thailand that the government didn't acknowledge that there were troops in Thailand. So was it difficult to write home and say, you know, I'm here in Thailand and um, did it have to be kept a secret that you were there? Not to the family, but everybody in the family knew where we were, where I was. Uh, you didn't go into anything that had happened. You know, you didn't go into aircraft losses or flight crew losses or uh, anything that happened to you. Out of the two jobs that you had, the um, ground safety and your other one, which one did you enjoy the most? The safety. The safety. Yeah. And how come that was? It was more challenging. You had to know more. You had to uh, know all the uh, Federal safety standards and standards in the states where in the state where country where you were at. When every place that you were stationed, did you have plenty of supplies? Yeah, yeah, yeah. For example, in Greenland, we ran out of beer and we threw in three three plane loads of it. So they made sure that you had all your your necessary supplies and leave supplies. <laughs> and whatever you felt was necessary, I guess. And the Air Force at that time had what they called a C-133, which is like a C-130 but bigger. And like I said, they threw three of them in with a load of nothing but beer. But you couldn't get a ship in at that point. The, ice was, the ocean was frozen solid. Mm -hmm. so. Um, how did you entertain yourself when you were in Iceland and in Greenland? The uh, USO sent entertainment troops in. They rotated them fairly regularly. Which ones came in? Mainly young ladies. Okay. And given a base, it was nothing but men. You know, mainly young ladies. Any famous ones? No, not up there. Mm -hmm. yeah. And nothing in Thailand or any of the other places? Uh, yeah, we had some famous people, not necessarily always on a base. I, for example, I went up, flew up to Udon to see Bob Hope in Christmas show in 66. 
But uh, what's his name? Guy that played wider on TV. Hugh O'Brien came into Thailand with a stage show of guys and dolls, of all things. You can't be, you can't feature Hugh you and Brian O'Brien doing that. But then after the show, he came out in his wide earth outfit and did fast draws for us. And at that point, we were locked. One point at, at the end of it, we were launching four F-4s on a strike, and the vice commander was on stage, and uh, he uh, said a few choice words and really got the audience going. <coughs> In Thailand, the uh, wing commander was a full colonel by the name of Robin Olds, who was married to a movie star, I forget her name. He was an ace in Europe in World War II, missed Korea, and he got four MiGs in Southeast Asia. The vice commander was another full colonel by the name of Daniel James, a Chappie James, who was black. He was a Tuskegee Airman. He stood probably three inches taller than I do and weighed more than I do and flew front seat on an F-4. I never knew how they got him into the front seat on an F-4. But uh, he could get the enlisted people up, and Olds could get the the flight crews up. Olds is the one I don't know if you ever heard of it on TV on the History Channel. If you watch it, they have done the program several times on what they called Operation Bolo over there, which New Year's Day of '67, uh, Colonel Olds had come up with the idea. They had 105s grounded for some reason. So we flew one of the 130s. They flew a 130 or two down or picked up the radar jam and gear off the 105s. Brought it back to Ubon, put their radar jamming gear on some of our F-4s. We flew the F-4s out on the same patterns, the same altitude that the F-105s flew with our F-4s flying top cover. And sucked the uh, MiG, MiG aircraft that belonged to North Vietnam to come up. And we got seven MiGs that day, the most they ever got one. One over there. Um, and there was another bad day where we lost seven aircraft going seven flight crews, so it, it balanced. What were your emotions during that time? Felt like it was one time I, uh, was doing something productive and getting the planes on their way. The uh, the flight crews were all very good people. They, they knew that we were the, the people on the grounds, the one that kept them in the air, basically. For general information, the way I got hurt, we were launching F fours on night strikes one night, and the first one went out. Second one had, had air burners and came right back out. And I climbed up on the storage tank to look, and he was burning. Fire was going past the canopies, and I came started down off the storage tank, and he had flares on board, and all the flares went off one time. Rolled flare, fire, maybe 150 feet up in the air, and he was loaded with. I think, as I remember, 17 or 18, 750 pound bombs, and they all went off in one fell swoop and blew me off an eight foot high bank about 70 feet through the air from the shockwave on the concrete or blacktop. And uh, I finally figured out some years later in England that I got hurt. It took that long. Yeah, yeah, you know, I didn't really think anything happened. As I told my wife at one point, where and she finally heard about it, which is at the point, it was at the point where I was in a wheelchair for two years, and I said it was not a good night that night. I almost stepped on a cobra that night too. We had seven. We had seventeen kinds of snakes on the base over there. Fifteen of them were poison, and 
three of them, I think it was, if they bet you, you might as well lay down because you weren't going to go ahead and make over one or two steps and you'd be dead. How was the medical? Um, we did not. Have, we didn't have a hospital on base. All we have is a clinic. Surprisingly, you know, the flight crew were injured. They transported them immediately to another base where there was a hospital. So did they check you out after that accident? What did they check you out after that accident? No, I didn't. You know, I just picked myself up and went on. I didn't think I was hurt. But it wound up costing me two knees and three surgeries on my knees. Four, really. Mm. Plus, it messed up my back and my neck. Of course, 21 years around jet engines, my hearing shot. <laughs> Do you use your um, veteran benefits? Yes, ma'am. I, I use the VA. Yeah. Not for everything. If I've got to have surgery, I uh, pop to go to the civilian route. And how come that is? It takes too long to get anything done through the VA normally. You know. Do you think that should be improved? Oh, God, yes. Uh, do you know Al Reynolds? Yes, I do. Okay, well, I am. Uh, I'm active in the DAV also, as much as I can be. And only I think they should improve that considerably. You know, the one thing I like now is the fact these young men come and lady men, women coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan are treated much better than we were when I came back in '67. You mentioned something about when you were in Indiana and the people over there treated you great, the civilians, and then when you came back from Thailand, it was different. Not in Indiana per se, but the country in general. I mean, I got spit on. I got called baby killer because I traveled in uniform. I was proud of that uniform. It was and still am. In San Francisco, they spit on me, called me a baby killer. And I looked at one of them and called me that, and I said, hell, that's all I could find to shoot at. And walked off and left him. Even though I never shot at anyone over there. But no, they treated us like dirt. I hear, thank you for your service now, much more than I did back then. Do you think that was the... Do you think Vietnam veterans were treated that way? Or do you think veterans in general were treated that way before the current crises? Well, I'm old enough. I can remember World War II in Korea. Those gentlemen were treated quite well, especially World War II. Korea, they say, is a forgotten war. I think it was just Vietnam. The people in this country did not like Vietnam. They weren't in favor of it, and they treated the military. Like dirt. Do you think it was the generation of of um, kids that treated the Vietnam soldiers? Primarily, yeah. Yeah, the older people were not, were not a problem. Why do you think it's different now? I don't know. I don't really know. Uh, I don't know, it's because it's an all-volunteer force now, and the country is aware of it, where they did have the draft during at least the biggest part of the way through, if not all the way through Vietnam, they had the draft. Like I said, a big reason, one of the big reasons I went in the Air Force, I didn't want to go in the Army, and in those days, in the 50s, they were drafting married men. And I was 20... One years old. No, I was 22. I was 22 years old. And I knew I was hot. 
And my wife and I talked over and said, well, yeah, let's go ahead and get it over with. Go in what you want. But even though they, the civilians, the country, didn't treat you because you were a soldier and good, you stayed in and made a career of it. Mm -hmm. Why? Why? Here with the guys of the people. The country failed. I was proud of serving this country. Was and still am. I uh, did my 21 in the Air Force, and about a year after I got out of the Air Force, I went back to work for the Department of Defense as a civilian for another 17 years. I think most people in my generation were proud of serving. Uh, it's a couple of books I've read on Vietnam. I read a lot on it. One was called Matterhorn, which was written by, have you read that? And my wife read that too. And uh, the gentleman that wrote that one wrote another one called How We Go to War. Have you read that one? Mm -hmm. So was my wife. And it gives you very good insight into what they should be doing for these young people coming back. And just a short while back, I met a gentleman who was in the Army Engineers in Vietnam, and he wrote a book called 13 Months and Two Weeks, which is about his time over there. A very good book also. I uh, am famous with the DAV in the local area because I have the feathers, and I give by the feathers, and I give them away. Does someone serve? I have worn feathers for... Uh, Korea, Vietnam, Desert Storm, Iraqi Freedom, Afghanistan, Purple Heart, POW, MIA feathers. I give them away. Someone served, I say thank you, and I give them a feather. Several years ago, when I, um, after I came out of the wheelchair and I was back to where I could walk, I went down to the Anna Veterans Home and did a uh, Memorial Day speech. And my wife and my sister-in-law and my oldest son went with, with me. And I called the Native American lady who makes the feathers for me. And I told her I want 45 World War II feathers for the gentleman in the home down there. And she said, there's about 20 different ribbons. Which one do you want? I said, I don't give a damn just so it's World War II feather. So after I made the talk, I gave everyone there a feather for the service of World War II. Mm. It's just a small way to say thank you. I, uh, for several years, I bought paintings by uh, or prints by Native American artists that I know that have military theme or some such theme, and I give them. I put them into all the Illinois veterans' homes. I've given them to people within the DAV that I respect nationally and state and locally. How do you feel that we could teach our children, or do you think our schools are teaching our children um, about the history of um, the service and wars that America has been in? Based on the four children my wife and I raised, I don't think the schools do an adequate job of teaching any level of American history. What would you, as a citizen, like to see? Now that is, that's the hardest question you've asked me. I don't, I don't know, that was one I'd have to think on for a while, but they really need to go back beyond, I think now about all these kids here about it, maybe back to World War II, I don't know. I, about the only thing I have to do with schools anymore is I go to Veterans Day observances. 
but I don't think they go far enough back. I don't think they teach them adequately about the Civil War. I know pretty much along my they don't teach them anything about the Revolutionary War. And I don't know that they teach very much about Vietnam. And uh, I think they should. I went into schools to talk to kids about Vietnam. And it opened up the questions, and the questions I get are, did you know my grandpa? And this is sixth, seventh, and eighth graders. He should, I think, no more than that, be more concerned about, did you know my grandfather? If someone came to you and said, I think I want to join the service. Do you think what? I want to join the service. What would you tell them? Well, I have two grandsons in service now. I have one who's in the Navy as a corpsman and attached to uh, the Marines at Camp Pendleton. He does work directly with the ones in the fights. He's a surgical tech works in the operating room. I have another grandson in the Coast Guard. And I have told people, I don't know if I'd want to go to service now. When I was in, like for example, Vietnam, I know people that did four and five tours or whatever because they wanted to. These kids now get sent over repeatedly and you can't do that without having, if not a physical, Injury, you get, you get mental injuries, whether they get hurt or not. You have mental problems. They called it Battle of the Day in World War II. They call it PTSD now. I have a lot of friends that have PTSD bad. Don't you think um, that PTSD was something that a lot of our soldiers came back with from Vietnam? Korea? I know a lot of them did in Vietnam. Uh, they said World War II to Korea, I think they call it battle fatigue, which is the same thing. I think myself, I had it to a degree when I came back. Uh, my wife threatened to leave me at one point because I changed. And a friend who was a B-24 and B-29 pilot at World War II just flat told her, he said, you can't go through what he went through. And, not change, but I managed to work my way through it. At least I think I did. Were you stationed in Vietnam? No, I was in Thailand. Okay. Yeah. And and the thing I wanted to say is, some people would say to you, "But you weren't stationed in Vietnam, but you were stationed in a combat zone." Yes, ma'am. Yeah. And that's yeah. a point that I would like to make, that you were stationed in a combat zone. Oh, yes. The uh, VA finally, a year or two ago, decided the six bases in Thailand were exposed to herbicides. They will not say Agent Orange, but they're exposed to herbicides, which opens up to claim for heart problems and associated diseases that are just automatic if you were exposed to Agent Orange. In my case, I have our problem. I have a friend in the Army who was in the Army, my best man when I married my wife. It was career Army, and he was in country in Vietnam. He's had major heart problems. The little paper down where, basically, I grew—I won't say I grew up there, but I graduated in high school in that area. My parents stayed there till they died down around Hardin County in Illinois, Elizabethtown. They're doing a series now on uh, Meet Your Neighbor, that little paper, and uh, I just did an interview with her. And, She asked some questions about Vietnam too, and I don't know. It's, it was not a good time, but I 
if they hadn't tied our hands, I'm certain in my own mind we could have won it. They had targets that we could not hit. And then when the politicians decided we should hit them, we lost men we shouldn't have lost. The Tynegan Steel Mill right out of Hanoi was uh, on their restricted list for several months while I was over there and they took it off and we lost, I think, six aircraft and crews going in to hit that one because they'd increased their air defense. It's bad. I just, that was the one thing I'll give him credit for when they went into a Desert Storm. The politicians basically kept their nose out of it. And that one we won in 105 hours. <coughs> so you belong to the DV, DAV. Yes, ma'am. DAV and VFW. And VFW. Do you think that has been beneficial for you? I think the DAV more than VFW, but uh, they're they're both very good organizations. All the veteran service organizations are very good. I think the DAV is the best. I think they have the best trained service officers. They can do more for a uh, individual. I tell anyone that wants to, that comes and talks to me about putting a claim in, I say go to the Illinois Department of Veterans Affairs office in Belleville. Let them run the paperwork, and you put in a form, and I don't remember the form number that designates the disabled American veterans to work to claim for you. Uh, is there anything else that you'd like to say? No, I don't think so. Okay. Well, I would like to thank you for your time. I'd also like to thank you for serving our country and doing a fantastic job. And thank you. You know how much I appreciate people saying that. I, I tell everyone that. Uh, one question the young lady asked in that interview I did with the paper down there was, where do you like to go on vacations at? And I said, anywhere west in this country. Last year, my wife and I went out through Wyoming and South Dakota, and we stopped in Gillette, Wyoming, and so she could do the laundry after we'd been out a week, and we went into this one restaurant to eat. And I got, we got sitting there talking to the people, with the tables around us, and I had on this hat, Vietnam vet hat. We got, we got ready to leave, and the waitress said, you don't owe anything. The couple back there bought your dinner. And when we walked out with them, he told me that, he said, we have a house in some little town in Arizona. I never heard of it. You know, we lived out there for two years. And he said, you ever want to go down to Arizona for three or four days? He said, Here's my phone number, call me, I'll send you the keys, and you can stay down there for three or four days three, free of charge. I've never had that happen, except that one time. But it really does make you feel very good about the people in this country again. You know, I said, Buddha didn't work last night. I said, they shot the damn plane down, basically. We put it on an emergency strip, and I guess it's still sitting there. And he said, well, Buddha worked. That's the way he made He said, you didn't get hurt. And you can't fault that logic. You know. Can you show me your Buddha again? Yeah. This one is the only one I got left, and it's about 1,200 years old. It came out of the jungle. The jeweler, I bought all my jewelry from over there, gave it to me. And for years I didn't wear it, and I went to a jeweler I know here in town and had him make the bezel around it so I could start wearing it again. They thought enough of me to give it to me, then I should wear it. And one of the natives um, from Thailand gave that to you? Yeah, the jeweler, he was Chinese. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you said something um, that uh, you were told that you should not walk around by yourself? <sighs> 
Ubon, Thailand. And when we got there, they had about three days of briefings come in. One thing they told us there was 35, 35,000 North Vietnamese communists in the town and around the area. And you should not go anywhere by yourself. They're going, they could, they, probably there was a price on your head, they could kill you if they wanted to, you know. And what did you do? You walked around by yourself? Sure. Yeah. And what did you carry in your pocket? Candy. And who did you give that to? The children. Okay. The children. Okay. And do you feel that helped you get along? I think the people knew that I was a fairly good individual. No one bothered me. Oh, I also carried a Marine K bar knife in my boot. Was, yeah, uh, the security police on base could not carry a weapon in the open. They had to carry their M16s in a locked metal container when they were on patrol. And uh, what they did, they put the M16 in the container, put the lid down, put the lock in the hasp shut, latch the lock shut, put the lid down so they had access. We had, uh, we had incidents, we had, uh, they found uh, some mortars out off the base one day that were lined up on the area that I worked in. They just didn't have the shells there yet. The uh, Thai police took the people. You never know what, knew what happened to them. There was one night I came in about midnight. There was a C-130 up over the base, just circling constantly, kicking flares out. And what they had was six or seven helicopters came out of Cambodia, about seven kilometers out from the base, and dropped off radar about a half a mile from the base. So they had them up there throwing players so we could see if anything happened. And the next morning about daylight, there was Thai Air Force T-28s about a mile out, just machine gunning the hell out of a tree line. I don't know what, that, what was out there. You know. It was an interesting place. They just not... You know, they don't look at things like we do. I had a friend that I knew had known in Lincoln, Nebraska, my first full-time base. They came over and they wanted a blanket bear. And we were downtown one day when after we got there at a jewelry shop, shop looking jewelry, and we're sitting at a counter drinking a sing high beer. And he looked out and he says, Oh my god, and I looked out, there's four ties walking down the street. Two with M16s and two with the old World War II M1 ran two carbines. I looked at him. I said, "That's Thai Border Patrol. Don't worry about it." And probably 30, 45 seconds later, something started popping down the street. Then I came off a stool, across the counter, down behind it, in one move. Turned out all they were doing—they were having a Buddhist funeral and shooting firecrackers. You know, good reflexes. I would not have done it. I'm glad I didn't have to go back a second time. But also had friends I know and they knew in the Air Force who never went, and I don't think that was right. Because one was a, he worked at SAC headquarters, and he never had to go. I made an awful lot of good friends in there. I still wonder where some whatever happened. Some of them up here. I'm, I'll be 78 this year, so I'm up here. Most of them are dead. You talked about the DAV a while ago, and I can truthfully say I've never met anyone in the DAV that I did not like. They're all good people. 
My wife says that Vietnam is nothing but a big club now. She says anywhere you go, anywhere we go, you meet someone that was there and he said, you guys know each other automatically. You know. The story behind the feathers is that, like I said, for two years I was in a, in a wheelchair. And my wife and I do a lot of Native American shows and powwows and things. And we were down in Oklahoma City in a thing called Red Earth. And I'm rolling around in a wheelchair and I saw somebody that had a feather like this, not exactly like this. We had a Vietnam campaign ribbon feather on his hat. And I said, that's cool. Where'd you get that? He says, hell, I don't remember. He said, some powwow I went to and he walked off. And the next year we're down there and I had the knee back in my leg and I'm walking along with a cane with my wife and this gentleman stops us. Takes his hat off, reaches up on his hat, pulls a feather off and he said, when I got home to Gallup last year, I went to the powwow. And there was a feather there. And I bought it and I've carried it on the dashboard of my car for a year because I knew I would find you there. And then a year or so after that, again, I was down, we were down there and I saw a Native American lady from North Carolina that had these on her table. And I said, what do you want for them? She said, two dollars and a half. And I said, how many you got? And she said, 35 or something like that. And I said, I'll take them all. And she said, what are you going to do with them? So I'm going to give them away. And she said, well, I'll sell them to you for a dollar and a half. And I said, well, if I want more, what do I do? And she said, here's my email address. You just send me an email, tell me how many you want. I'll ship them to you and you send me back a check. And that's what we've done since about 2005. Amazing. Again, going back a few years, I uh, there's a, a little church down in Anna that has a very decent, very good Veterans Day program on Sunday, either right before. And my wife and I are on the board of what do you call it? We're the board of advisors, the board of advisors for the Veterans of Anna, and I kept getting invitations down to it. And it wasn't convenient to go, and we went down on a Saturday for a something to do with my old high school I graduated from, which doesn't exist anymore. And then on Sunday, we went over for that. And we're sitting in there, and this light came on in my head. When we got back in the car, I pulled a Vietnam feather out of the bag, and I gave it to my wife because I said, you went through it just like I did. The kids know they weren't one that can remember any of it. She remembers it all very well. Our oldest son was in the Navy and our youngest son was a Marine. The oldest son went to the American Navy when I was stationed at Bent Waters, England. So I had the pleasure of going down in full Class A Air Force uniform or all the ribbons to the American Embassy and swearing him into the Navy. I bet that was a proud moment. Yeah, yeah, it was. Uh, well, for he went in the Air Force, but like he told me, he said, Dad, I wasn't smart enough. And I've had to have it for several years now that I take my two sons and the oldest grandson who was in this area now with the Coast Guard down to Carbondale to SIU, which is where I went to college at, for a football game ready fall. And several years ago, again, three or four years ago, the only, the only hat I wear is this one. And some gentleman behind me, I use the term gentleman loosely, decided he wanted to talk about Vietnam. And I said, were you there? No. I said, I won't talk about it. And I tried to ignore him. He would not be ignored. And I finally turned around and looked at him. I said, I don't talk about it to my wife. Why would I talk about it to some son of a bitch like you? And he got up and left. You people are the only ones I've ever talked to about it besides my wife. And I appreciate the chance to uh, talk about some of it.
I get this thing, I'll probably do it like I did the first one. I told my wife, this is going in the drawer and nobody looks at this till I'm dead. Okay. I appreciate you taking the time, both of you, to come down to Springfield. Uh, I'm sorry, my two guys had reasons why they couldn't make it. I don't know how many people even had to come in and talk.